Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a wonderful evening yesterday, slept well, and be ready to embrace this brand new day. I would like to thank you, each one of you, for joining us today, the second day of YMF 2019. Yesterday uh, was an informative and fruitful day. We heard from Dr. Martin Stopford, who shared his valuable insights on challenges and solutions faced by our industry. We then heard from the ship owners, operators, industrial uh, associations, uh, marine time insurances, and consultancy, all sharing their views on the state and the future of the marine time communities. Session one and session three provided stakeholder perspective on those issues, while session two focused on a very import important issue of how to embrace, uh, empowering women to embrace the diversity and how can we create a better world. Before we start today, I'd like to share some exciting news of two events that occurred last uh, evening in celebration of the 160th anniversary of Port of Yokohama. Port of Yokohama and Port of Vancouver <coughs> celebrated 38 years as sister ports by signing a new MOU to strengthen our relationship by advancing environmental leadership within our ports and the shipping industry. Also, Port of Yokohama officially joined World Ports Climate Action Program, WPCAP, a group formed by leading ports around the world that are determined to take actions on reducing GHG emissions with addition of Port of Yokohama, WPCP now has 12 member ports. Thank you. So yesterday was truly a memorable day. Moving on today, kicking off this beautiful day number two of YMF, we have a very interesting presentation delivered by a truly special and distinguished guests. Before joining PSA International in 2011, our next speaker was already recognized as a global leader. Having more than 20 years of experience in Shell, the energy tycoon, as dedicated CEO of PSA International, a leading global port group with operation in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and Latin America. Our next speaker has been a leader in the evolution of marine time industry technology. On a personal note, his passion for and faith in digitalization and technology innovation was truly inspirational. I was fortunate to have one hour conversation with him in his office with this stunning view of uh, Singapore Harbor. Well, it was rather a lecture than a conversation. But his passion didn't stop him for even a single moment, not even a moment for a sip of tea. And that one hour spent for me was an eye-opening experience. And since then, I've become one of his biggest fans. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Tan Cho Ming, the PSA, CEO of PSA International. <laughs> Mr. Tan, please have the floor. Sakura-san, you set me up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, uh, well, here we go. Well, there's a very bright light, so I can't even see you. I assume you're out there somewhere. Um, thank you, Sakura-san, again for that uh, very glowing introduction. Uh, certainly, after Dr. Martin Stopford, how can one not be urgent about trying to address some of the issues that we face today? 
I think as a group, we tend to be very good at talking about the problems, sometimes less good at talking about the solutions, because the solutions sometimes escapes us because it requires a community to act. Firstly, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be invited to be a part of the 160th uh, anniversary celebration of the Port of Yokohama. I think the Port of Singapore predates the formation of PSA, there was Singapore Harbour, but I really honestly don't know how long, and we don't have a such uh, a long and illustrious history, but we certainly are envious, and we want to be a part of the, the history as well as the future of the Port of Yokohama as well. So congratulations for 160 years. Now, turning to matters at hand, um, I just want to link up to what Dr. Martin Stopford shared yesterday at the opening, which I thought was a very good, um, also a lecture, actually, from his wisdom on the state of the nation or the state of our affairs, as well as the areas of urgency that he thought was important for all of us to recognise and some of the things we could deal with. And suddenly, climate change and carbon was front and centre, the contribution of carbon to climate change is something that is less refuted than what do you do about it. Suddenly, with urgent need in looking at the technologies available, Dr. Martin then went on to talk about the energy system as well as the technology that is required to bring that energy system plus the way in which we do things differently, going from 14, 16 knots to perhaps 10. So solutions that were discussed were a lot in shipping, I would submit that to append to that, many of the solutions that we have to deal with in the world today is to do with consumption and the responsibility of the individual. Now think about the concept of today's economy. Today, we still live very much in an extract, produce, consume and dispose world, and what some would describe as the linear economy. A new concept that has gained traction in the last decade is the concept of the circular economy. Today's global logistics has given rise to globalization and in fact fostered further movement in the linear economy where land, labor, regulatory arbitrage was the way in which companies, manufacturers, myself for 20 over years being one, um, tried to find competitive advantage. It was measured by capital markets. But if we are going to live in a future world of carbon, influence economy, what are the ground rules? And how do consumers respond to those ground rules? And what is the role of logistics in creating the possibilities of the new economy? I submit that one of the things that uh, logistics have to play is the new role in illuminating the flow of cargo and hence allowing the optimization of movement, good flow of cargo so that production, manufacturing, consumption and reverse logistics can actually take place for full recycling. So it's not about trade volumes being lower, but it's about smarter trade. Dr. Martin talked about regional, more regional production and more short sea. Uh, I happen to be also a believer in that. I think it will move in that way because of a number of forces. Uh, Jeremy Nixon then talked about how shipping lines tend to follow the market in its development. And over time, has been mandated to create Enough, hence high capacity, cheap and efficient logistics. But as we all see in the last few years, not necessarily reliable. So there is a, there's, there is a, there is a tension. And the reason perhaps for some of that unreliability is because of the agenda of manufacturers vis-a-vis -vis the agenda of consumers as they begin to actually go separate ways. And as Jeremy said and recognised, consumers tend to want to buy less and more frequently. And perhaps the solution then is in connectivity. Is our connectivity between consumer demand, manufacturers' production and the rest of logistics service providers actually allowing all of us to provide reliable, optimal and sustainable service? And hence the topic for today, how does digital play a part by creating an ecosystem for this convergence. So to Sakura-san, sorry, I'm going to uh, uh, borrow the concept, not so much of the cherry blossom, but of the acronym ROSE, R-O-S-E, Reliable, Optimal, Sustainable Ecosystem. 
And let me begin. Now, I'll give you a little bit of context. The first, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, us for a few minutes, and then after that, I'm going to talk about our take of the problem or the situation that demands a response for a little bit um, and, and what's not going to go away. Uh, and then after that, hopefully, uh, uh, this is the first time I'm making such a presentation, actually, on our view of what the solution could look like in the digital space. So PSA International, if it needs introduction, we are the world's largest port group based on equity-weighted throughput with flagships in Singapore and Antwerp. 81 million TUs, slightly more than 10% of global container handling. And this is a map of the portfolio. We hug the equatorial belt, the east-west route, the Trans-Pacific now, as we entered into more investments this year in the Atlantic Basin, but traditionally, we have been very much Asia, Europe, and also a little bit of the South America and Americas. And in Asia, of course, China is a very big piece. Traditionally, we have only invested in the black dots, which are like Yokohama, a port that is linked to sea. But in the last two years, we have gone inland in a number of countries significantly. We have a share in the largest ICD network in China, together with the China Rail Group. We've invested in Canada, and that dot is missing. Ashcroft, and our Port of Vancouver, <laughs> Duncan and other colleagues are here. Um, and also in other places. Our belief is that in order for um, supply chain to become more sustainable, we must try to have more visibility at key nodes. And when you think about short C, well, Short C is just the maritime equivalent of more regional-based logistics. And inland is as important as short C. And so as a result, the optimization of flow within very large production and consumption communities like China becomes very important. So it's not all about the sea. But there's a dichotomy because the sea container don't want to go inland. So how, how do we actually build a bridge? And that's PSA, in a few words. Um, then I talk about the mega shifts. The mega shifts that are immediate, and these mega shifts are not all the mega shifts, it's not about SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, but it's about those mega shifts that are immediately affecting our industry, meaning the logistics and supply chain industry. Needs no introduction, there's a technological revolution, consumer power, and changing manufacturer's playbook. Now, this is a good caricature of the technological revolution. On the digital side, mobile computing was a big enabler. So in 2005, when there was the appointment of Pope Benedict, the picture outside Sistine Chapel looks like this on the left. And then in 2013, at the appointment of Pope Francis, eight years later, that's the view, unadulterated. So the world did not just see a new pope. The, so, the world saw a new order in social communication. An image became information. Today, that same information is now intelligence. And that's the thing that is troubling the world, frankly. Not so much the information that shares what I ate last night on Facebook, but the intelligence of what it means to other people who are watching me. It can be for good. It can also be not for good but now it is intelligence. That new order started at that time. It's not turning back, right? E-commerce. Growing, doubling every few years. I think the rate of growth is now a little slower, but the way that it's growing is also dramatically different. B2B e-commerce is becoming more important. The beginning was B2C e-commerce. And we've handled containers in, now in Singapore where a single 20-footer will have 100,000 consignees and a 40-footer will have 200,000 consignees. And typically, the shipping industry freaks out. <laughs> Actually, not the shipping industry. The customs and regulators freak out. <laughs> but they're all part of the industry. So how do we create assurance, comfort, and the possibility of handling more e-commerce which cannot be carried by air when weight goes up? Move that into sea, and how does that create an efficient product? And today in Singapore, there's already a product under one of the e-commerce groups where if it is not air, 
if it is not invisible and very long, there's actually an intermediate product of sea air that supports e-commerce. And we actually move one, T, one FEU every day through Singapore port with 200,000 consignees. But the beginning of this was innocuous and several years ago, and it's unstoppable. In fact, these technological revolutions often give rise not just to consumer behavior differences, but to business model changes. And so this wise man said many, many, many years ago, banking is necessary, banks are not. And in fact, today, when you, when you think about this uh, quote, you can substitute the word bank for a few other things. <laughs> Entertainment is necessary, cinemas are not. <laughs> and, and so on, right? And in our industry, where it's physical, not just digital money and so on, the manufacturer's playbook has also changed. And it's not only because of digital, but of the whole advent of physical, human, and digital convergence. And in the physical, human part, we talk about VR, AR, 3D printing. It is truly happening, and it's changing. In fact, as industry players in supply chain, I encourage all of us to truly spend more time in how the manufacturer's playbook is changing. Now, having had the advantage and the benefit, and maybe the burden or the curse, of being a manufacturer for 20 over years, I saw how manufacturers change from managing inventory by push to managing inventory by pool information, and now looking at reclustering or reconfiguring their manufacturing factory system so that they have most efficient, almost leading to batch size one manufacturing. Manufacturing on demand, rather than just managing the inventory. Uh, it's good, provided it's efficient and zero waste. But how to make sure that that happens? Traditionally, uh, myself, I've gone through a period where manufacturers go crazy to get sticky to their customers. So CRM, SAP, all these were configured to be sticky to their customers. And their logic is, of course, that's what pays the top line. But what is the view of logistics that actually supports the management of efficient flow and distribution of the goods that satisfies the top line? Well, that relationship is one of love-hate. <laughs> they want to have the ability to onboard whichever logistics service provider that is procurement-wise most beneficial. And so, while there's a lot of focus on having stickiness on a customer side, there has been less effort to create deep stickiness on the supply chain side, preferring to leave that to optionality. And to some extent, our visibility of the movement of products really only starts when a manufacturer decides, I'm going to ship this. But not at the point where they are debating Am I going to produce? And if so, actually, where am I going to produce? Which factory and how? When I was deciding where to build lubricants plants, you always have regulatory advantage, you always have costs and labor issues and so on, but very seldom was there in the paper the uh, analysis on connectivity, reliability, and the options on distribution. So, just think about that. And I don't think we have changed very much yet, except that in the world today, some of the big manufacturers and distributors are actually trying to get into logistics themselves. And of course, technology... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we can have a dialogue. <laughs> now, and some of the uh, manufacturers are already uh, seeing their products being revolutionized, and it has its implications. And technology revolution continues. So we are going to continue to see this wave. Whether quantum computing will become mainstream anytime soon, I don't know. Uh, but certainly within my lifetime, we should see it uh, coming into, uh, in, into, in, into the, the, the core of our businesses. Because just a few days ago, we saw this. The credibility of this is still being questioned. Uh, but that's how all inventions go, right? As we remember about Thomas Edison, fake it till you make it. 
Okay. So there's no turning back. The egg has become an omelette. You can't put it back in the shell. And as a result of that, I believe, and this is my own analysis of the world, that every time you have a wave of technology, you have a wave of uh, process, business model change, uh, and then after that you move forward and then it continues to sort of build up or snowball. And that has been the wave of technological change over the last 10 years. I started from uh, Sistine Chapel. <laughs> mobile computing, data connectivity platforms, cloud, IoT, advanced manufacturing. And you know the Gartner cycle, right? These are the moments where I thought they became slightly more mainstream. Not the advent of the technology, but the point of application of the technology. So it's not about who signed up to trade lens, it's about how many people actually use. I think there was a difference in view yesterday about whether we are digital and blockchain enough, and there was a view that we are already there. Frankly, we're kind of in between. So these are the days when we actually see it affecting mainstream industry. And what happens then is the emergence of societal, behavioral, business model, industrial change as a result. Now fast forward a little bit more. A few questions. If we truly have quantum computing, will we have chaos or convergence? The fact that we'll find it very difficult to encrypt, is that a plus or a minus? And how do we take advantage of the positives in reimagining logistics while we are busy, very busy, and today cybersecurity is right at the top of my board agenda <laughs> to deal with the ill effects? Well, that's again an omelette, and we can't put it back in the shell. And it continues beyond our industry, they also brought. Um, uh, Trends, tensions, we know this one. This is an interesting one. I believe this will continue. Cross-integration. It's not just vertical, it's not horizontal. We read in the textbook, if you go back to textbooks, it's either vertical or horizontal. Sorry people, I have to say, that textbook is outdated. It's cross. Tencent became bigger than HSBC <laughs> in a very short time. And then, of course, this one, the big elephant in the room, concerns about sustainability. And I talked a little bit about <clears throat> circular economy. Um, another one of my role is I'm also chairman of JTC, Jurong Town Corporation, the big industrial developer in Singapore. And we are really contemplating this subject on how to bring circularity. Uh, let me just spend one minute on this and then go back to digital. <clears throat> what is this concept, which I believe will be quite... Think about uh, the LPG cylinder. The LPG business would not be viable today if the cylinder did not have reverse logistics and was not circular in its metal management. A cylinder is designed, purpose, to be used over multiple life cycles, usage cycles. Or think about your microwave oven or your washing machine. After five or six years of useful, dutiful usage, uh, the poor machine is relegated to become an unwanted item. And my wife always asks me, what do I do with it? Will they take it away? I said, take it away, then where does it go? There's a washing machine graveyard. But we all know as engineers that certain parts have a single life cycle, but many parts have multiple life cycle, if we so choose. But what if there is a way to have viable reverse logistics? so that they get back to the manufacturer or close to manufacturer for repurposing. In fact, if manufacturers had to bear the responsibility for their product over multiple life cycle, what would they truly do if reverse logistics was there with information for less waste? And today, of course, in e-commerce, reverse logistics is already a requirement because many of the things that Sakura buys online, Sakura-san, you return. Hmm. So, I, and, but today's industrial concept is please take the industry as far away as possible from urban. And we want push logistics to be bulky, cheap, and cost-wise low. But why are we always measured by that cost that is all economy? If you put carbon into the picture, that equation should change. 
So instead of always being led by IFRS and how to then get investment from your shareholders, we actually should have a new energy accounting method. In our business, we talk about new solutions in shipping. But today, if let's say um, Walmart were to ask its logistics service providers on a carbon footprint of two similar routes, and assuming those two routes are by two shipping lines who are alliance, meaning they actually load on each other's ship, and they have to report the carbon footprint of two similar routes, I bet you today they'll be different. Now, today, we use IFRS to tell us the economic data of a company before we invest, because we trust in IFRS. But how do we trust and make decisions, be, be it a shareholder, an investor, or even a consumer, in reports, in information that has not been subject to a certain degree of sound science and accounting? So we, if we want to create a new order, actually, we need a lot of things. But I also submit that we can create all this in a much easier and faster way because of digital capability. I can crowdsource a lot of carbon data and create for you one version at least of the truth. It's like Wikipedia, for instance. Think about that. Crowdsource information to give you one version of the truth, constantly updated. And blockchain is also a similar, a community version of the truth. So we don't need to exercise all our dot-coms to try and do all the detailed calculations. Anyway, I don't want to go too far into that, otherwise I'll be off topic. Suffice to say that because of the absence of good rules, our business models have not changed and we're still very fragmented. So if you're fragmented, you must have unreliability. You must have pain points. You must be the brunt of the complaint of the people who use you. And we should not be surprised. But this should not be a discouragement. This should actually be an encouragement. Because if there's nothing to improve, we are, we're stuck. <laughs> so so the, 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 this, this is a couple of years ago now, but 80% feel that connectedness and visibility needs to be improved. And of course, now we have applications that allow for greater visibility. And efficiencies within supply chain, are not, in, inefficiencies are still there. And in fact, there's a certain proportion that feel that there's no visibility at all whatsoever. We struggled with this. We've gone big, we tried fast, we tried slow, we tried to connect, we tried to improve GCR, gross crane rate, I'm sure in part of Yokohama, that's one of your KPIs, <laughs> and so on. But, you know, we have not broken through. So the solution can't be in the mechanics only. Also, our customers' demands are changing. And what is the cost of this unreliability? I just take the food sector to get us off our seats. This number is more than the money made by all logistic companies in the world. And that's waste. And it's not at consumption nor production. It is within the supply chain. Now, who's responsible for this, by the way? So it's not that the world suffers from hunger, it suffers from the callousness of consuming what God, oh my God, what Mother Earth has produced for us as food. <laughs> so, would it be any surprise that the BCOs themselves, when they confront these issues, are actually saying, I wish there were different ways of dealing with this. So obviously, yes, uh, you know, many changes in the past few years, but also many, uh, many things that haven't changed in the past few years. Mm -hmm. Starting with, with what has changed, obviously stating the, the obvious, uh, you know, supply chains have become more global. Another thing that has been changing, you know, and it's very important in Southeast Asia, is the, uh, you know, the number of incidents of uh, you know, weather events, and basically catastrophic events like uh, you know, typhoon, volcanoes, you know, recently in, uh, in Bali, earthquakes in, uh, in Japan or Indonesia. So a lot of uh, natural disasters that, you know, uh, and our supply chain have to cope with that. Now, a few things as well that haven't changed and that are not keeping up with the, with the supply chain uh, change is um, in, in some country, infrastructure investment hasn't followed the growth of the country. Uh, one example could be Philippines, 
where we see a growth of uh, no demand growth by consumers uh, more than 10 percent. But you know the, uh, the investment is happening, but not fast enough. Regulation as well hasn't kept up. Uh, we, can, we continue to see obviously a lot of you know, paper based, a lot of red tape in the age of digitization, uh, and you know so that's that's something that's an opportunity. And the last one, it's you know visibility needed to more to drive more of a strategic. Uh, strategic choices for supply chains. Today, you know, you mentioned vast amount of data that are available, and you know they are available with the carriers, maybe with PSA internally as ourselves at PNG. We have vast amount of data, but this data is not used. And we have to be able to start using this data to really pinpoint structurally what doesn't work in our supply chain or what can be improved, or, and, and and as well, you know, being able to have you know, that's a buzzword to be able to drive predictive analytics. So this is one of the conversations, the many conversations that we've had in the last few years under a banner of back to basics in PSA that we try to understand what BCOs really, really want. And I highlighted Lucas, David Lucas because he's, um, uh, he's, in our engagement with him, he's always very willing to offer views as well as inputs and content. And the last piece of what he said was quite insightful. We have lots of data. I said maybe also in PSA. Well, not maybe we do. Um, but what do you use? Uh, how, how, and, and what? How do you use it? And what do they want? They want to make strategic decisions. Of course, they want to make event-driven decisions. But uh, they want to take 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 it one level higher. And so this this whole challenge for us have gotten us back to thinking: What is the state of our supply chain? And how do we weave in today's technology in making it different? So I'll very quickly go through this concept, um, and then uh, uh, you know later on we can uh, you can give me the feedback. And I look forward to because as I say, it's one of the first times I'm actually sharing this. Typically, global supply chain involves multiple participants. We all know that it's a team sport. There is a buy, ship, and pay cycle or a movement that goes from exporter to um, importer, consignee, and there are three main parts of the flow, and one is physical, involves movement of goods, and inevitably multimodal, inevitably transmodal, at least on the land part. But most of the time, we don't really see that. Um, transport documents and a lot of documents, like other things that relates to the cargo itself, usually paper-based in the past. Then there's compliance flow, again, more documents, interactions with the regulators. But when you talk about compliance flow, you see the box gets bigger. And then of course financial flow, then you involve everybody in the room. Early innovation in digitization, mainly between adjacent participants in a linear supply chain. So our experience and the experience of our business partners, be it uh, MERS, MSC, and so has been to try and bring communities together through e-portals or port community systems, and uh, like the PortNet in Singapore today is so, uh, 30 years old. And TradeNet is the relationship between shippers and LSPs and the government, customs mainly, and that is also about 30 years old. So they are very function-based, process-based, uh, transaction systems. But that means that the, 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 an opportunity over time to optimize the flow that emanates from those sub-processes. I'll give you an example. Portnet, because we, there's only one operator in Singapore, that's PSA, that Portnet is linked into our terminal operating system. So it's not just an exchange of info, but it actually optimizes um, the events that our users, partners, actually have to interact with. And that is also one of the reasons why you never see a jam outside a PSA port. Even though 15% or 5 million TUs actually go in and out of the gate because of the local cargo. And that is by any measure a reasonable size port. And then, of course, when you go broader, you get to fragmentation. You've got legacy systems, MRP, SEMs, blah, 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 right? So that's, that's the current state. Now, digitization of supply chain is more challenging than Uber. I know Uber is not here. Many colleagues may not uh, 
uh, uh, associated with this. But think about any social platform that does single function application. So right hailing is one. And it's about half a dozen pieces of data that is needed. Your identity, your credit card, where you, want, where you are, where you want to go, and then you match up with a resource. And then if the journey is done, the transaction is closed. It's real time, and the, you, the person who carries the data is actually live and present. And in fact, this part about requesting a right easy one, two, three is uh, Uber, not our invention. They say it's easy. <laughs> And of course, then you step up to airline reservation systems, which have been in the world now for many years, decades. In fact, can you imagine our life today as global tra travelers, many of you who are in the room today, if there was not for this invisible and on the background re airline reservation system? And today, there are only two big ones and subsidiaries beneath that. They're not even owned by airlines. It started out being owned by airlines. And then through acquisition and reconstruction, they have seamlessly transferred data exchange and you can book anywhere, it goes anywhere. You can even book a seat. But it has a lot more data. Now you get to supply chain, hey, our favorite. Now it's a little bit more complicated. 30 documents and you know, data items. We, we actually have a map of the data items and I don't even show it anymore because it's font size 4 and nobody can see it. Okay, but think about the issues you have to deal with. And the other thing is the person is not with the cargo. Container is autonomous. And then we, this, this was a eureka moment for us. It only took place about six to nine months ago. That we saw the total confusion that was created by applications, infrastructure, platforms, data exchange, syntax, semantics, standards. And we say, oh my goodness, what are we dealing with? And actually, we have to turn the pin on its head and say, look, the key thing is about understanding that data. And we say at the simplest level, there are only two kinds of data in logistics. One is cargo-related, the other is event-related. And cargo-related is all data. When you close the doors on a container, that body of data is instantly and totally formed. What it is, where it wants to go, when it will open the doors again, the mission is completed, the financial implications, the regulatory implications. And that body of data is instantly formed, but it's not known. And it's then formed and known through discoveries in different subsystems. But it's not one version of the truth. So we need community, hence blockchain was the vehicle that said, ah, it can be that community because it's got to be secure, encrypted, immutable, and so on. It relates to a lot of cargo data, and of course then, that itself is not enough to make sure that there is a convergence between the knowledge of the cargo and the way it actually flows. So you need event data, that's track and trace and so on. Right? So now you can see, it's either related to the cargo itself, which is immutable, no use, doesn't help it move, and events that actually say, this is what's happening. Event data examples, cargo data examples, because indeed the list of documents are big, and each one of them have a lot of data that needs to be reused. So we went back to curating the data across languages, across countries. And started to say, oh, OK, we need a few things. For one, we need standards. And in the past, we've relied on these standards. Today, of course, we also have uh, a body called DCSA. It's trying to support the creation of new standards. The other challenge, it's on different systems. But having, a, and, and governance issues as well, yeah? the more uh, extended issues, if you like. But having an understanding of the basic types of data help us then formulate the architecture by which we need to further digitalization. Without which, frankly, you can have a lot of this, but they haven't made a difference. In fact, we are judged to be quite poor in this whole process. This is still where we are. I hope if we have this meeting in two years' time, we'll be a little bit higher up the curve. It takes all of us. But I think this is happening. We're going from linear to a more network organization, especially my conviction in the last six to nine months, the understanding of the concepts and philosophy has started to make a change. I was talking to Robert yesterday, Robert Khan, uh, the APM, uh, Merce, Merce gentleman, our colleague there. 
And uh, he was saying that he, their experience in trade lands is that initially about two years ago, it was very hard to get traction with government. Today, it's actually very easy. So it's changed. Okay, so convergence starts from data, but then we need to support the movement of data, and this is our thesis, and this is as an, another eureka moment for us. And that we need to have these five components in our future architecture at the most simple level. You, you have the applications, we need the standards, but we also need to have common infrastructure. And today, we, our world is very much defined by the infrastructure that we established years ago. Whether we are a 50 hertz or a 60 hertz electricity production, what pin plugs we use, what kind of protocols that we have, that either expands your options or limits you. That creates convergence and hence efficiency or it creates noise and waste. We have a choice. And all of us must take the responsibility of that choice because nobody else is deciding for us and we cannot keep talking about the problem without talking about the solution. And the solution is about making those choices. So we said, okay, most of the time speakers will stop here, but we want to share what PSA is doing. Applications, we are investing in applications that revamp our understanding of the way supply chain works at the last mile. Meaning when customers speak or when consignees talk. Uh, when I say customers, BCOs. Huh? So we have Holio, Delivery, Hakovo, and it's all done on a venture uh, capital basis. But we link to them in order to understand and get their insights on what they see through the e-commerce lens and so on. And you can imagine that. But internally, we are creating those with the chevrons, the, 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 the arrow sign, are our products. Uh, Podnet, Callista, One Handshake, Event Hub. I believe we need a data exchange platform. And that data exchange platform provides that data infrastructure with proper governance on how exchange can take place. It's a lot more than a SWIFT code. And we see TradeLens and GSBN playing that role. You see the word Event Hub there is PSA's single convergent data exchange mechanism. Because today, even though we want to promote exchange, we also have to be careful with the responsibility uh, that we have in managing the data of our joint ventures, our operations. Event Hub will cover all our terminals. Today, we are pumping into Event Hub data from Singapore, from Antwerp. And this is available to people who want to retrieve, but based on ground rules that will satisfy future regulations that may be country-based, that may be uh, uh, global-based, but certainly we have... Uh, all those obligations considered. So we've actually gathered it under one single governance and we exchange from that point. So we're ready. And Portnet, Callista, I'll talk about it. One handshake I will not talk about. One handshake is marine service system. It works with platforms like NTP, TradeNet, CargoSmart. Names I think you may have heard of. But basically, it just says that we need super platforms upon which applications can sit so that you have convergence and good API protocols. And they are able to have a good, uh, effective relationship with data infrastructure providers. Portnet is a 30-year-old journey. This is the data as of last year. 220 million transactions a year, 10,000 users annually. And this is just Singapore. It's already happening and has been that data exchange. Let me say that this data exchange is really only at the, as I remember my earlier slide, right, between adjacent players, but not starting from a point that certainly not David Lucas' ambition and aspiration or request that says, help me decide on my strategic decision on how to site my factory on the basis of best connectivity resilience. I can't answer that. But I think in future we can. Now think of Google traffic, right? Your phone. Ten years ago, before crowdsourcing of your data, at best, the trip was a speculation. Today, that trip says 23 minutes, and you can bet you it's plus or minus a minute. And you have different options. But what I wish for sometimes, I'm, a I'm, I'm an engineer, so I say, if there are two routes, tell me 23 minutes with 95% confidence, 22 and a half minutes with 50% confidence, I wish for that. In consumer, I don't need it. But in commercial, 
that confidence level may mean a lot of money. Can we do that? So this system is the beginning of trying to actually integrate those requirements so that the data body and the data usage can be formed with differentiation. It will cover, it's already live, it's been live for the last 10 months, reg physical, financial and regulatory flows, open architecture. It sits on top of trade lands or sits alongside you know, all the other things and it's also the host of other applications like Holio, Hakovo, so on. Today, we are, in fact, in one month's time, we will be the host of trade finance systems, uh, trade insurance systems. Uh, KIB has signed up with us. Finexa has come up, signed up with us. Uh, those are third parties, and we are also going to mainstream banks like DBS. Of course, industry standards. That's needed. So, so that, that is our view of our involvement at the moment. And I invite others to kind of plug in. And more collaboration. You know this. It's just a picture graph to say everybody's on board, to echo what Robert has said. But how do we use this? Where have people said, this makes sense for me? Starting from our port perspective, we say we can create these intermodals, these possibilities. And we, over the last year, tried to do these experiments in order to help us refine the value proposition differentiation and the purpose of what Kalista would be. That it's different from an info, different from a, a, a wise tech and so on, in terms of uh, not just giving a system integrated offer, but a customer requirement of uh, response. So just, uh, I'll quickly just on a single sheet basis talk about a couple of them. These are the target industries. If you look at them, they're curated on the basis of urgency, time, waste, high-value goods, customs, regulatory challenges. Not waste paper. Waste paper, shipment, no problem. <laughs> yeah. See, air e-commerce, I talked about this. Because of the pressure in Hong Kong, we actually do that through Singapore. Shippers do that. If you go to Singapore's Lazada and you see a product that says, Nine days, this is the product. Cheaper. This is the corridor. Today, this is not the only corridor, but this is the most best known corridor because this is the um, Singapore gov uh, government co project together with uh, China, creating this intermodal corridor. Now, to create an intermodal corridor between a sea hub and a land hub, very challenging because the land hub operates in... Well, the land hub firstly was non-existent. <laughs> so to make it exist and then to give the environment for its existence mean that you need the hub's condition as well as you need the corridor conditions. And because the corridor has competitive legacies and so on, it, quite a bit of effort. So we have to deal with the intermodal itself, we have to deal with the compliance challenges, we have to deal with trade advisory to persuade uh, customers, for instance, from Indonesia, instead of taking the old route to take the new route, and then create new visibility. We had to, for instance, like with a petrochemical company, deal with the requirements of the rail cust uh, uh, authority in Qingzhou, where they require six photos. It is a Japanese BCO based in Singapore. And we said, wow, you need photos. So we had to revamp Kalista in order to support photos. <laughs> but now it's intermodally through, for instance. Now, the, the LSPs, 4PLs, tend not to get into there because it, it, you, you, you have to connect to regulators and customs. They tend to create asset-based and process-based solutions. But here is focus on a few more complex things. Advanced transshipment. This is, this is uh, created actually to help efficient petrochemical flow from the Middle East to the entire Southeast Asia and East Asia. And we minimize inventory time by about 20-30%. Visibility up, all SKUs don't get lost. And we go back into production, not just from the point of freight booking. So we're linked into the BCO's ERP system. So the three value propositions after months of work, we say, if we want to create value, uh, what will people say we're different from just a system integrated product, SI product? It must be multimodal. It must help with compliance, and hopefully in future, it must deal with advisory. Event resilience, if there's a typhoon, what do you do? 
If you have a choice between two routes, which is a higher probability route? You have a choice between two factory locations, which has a better connectivity. But the way forward to get to that place where we can all enjoy the fruits is a tortuous one. Um, this is the approach that we have taken, and it has been very enjoyable. We have had to acquire a software engineering group uh, that used to be very strong in e-government and trade facilitation, but we said, no, 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 all these don't work unless you are a supply chain facilitator, because that's where the problems are. And so we've acquired that group last year, and they are the owners and drivers of this. We've got majority controlling share on an arm's length basis. Now, finally, finally, I close off with hopefully something that will uh, tell you that this is all possible and this will all be history. You recognize this name, Tim Berners-Lee? And maybe not the picture, but this was information management proposal. This was in March 1989, 30 years ago. This picture was a proposal for today's World Wide Web. This is what he called it. He gave it a name. Today we gave it a name called the World Wide Web. So what's the web? This it is used gentlemen. to be difficult to explain what the web would be like. Now it's difficult to explain why it was difficult. In 1980, when we used fax machines to share documents and travel agencies to book flights and hotels, Tim Berners-Lee, a young Oxford graduate, first came to CERN as an independent IT professional to computerize CERN's proton synchrotron's control system. But back in the 1980s, at CERN, it was an exciting place to be. Lots and lots of information systems on different computers, on different networks, all incompatible. So the idea was that one should be able to communicate by sharing information. He needed to understand a mass of information and how to link people, hardware and software. For that, he wrote a program and named it Enquire, after a Victorian reference book he remembered from his childhood for giving easy access to a mass of useful information. Tim wrote the first proposal for the World Wide Web in March 1989. By the end of 1990, Tim Berners-Lee had the first web server and browser up and running on his next computer at CERN. The number of hits on this machine, it started off as 100 a day, then a year later it was 1,000 a day, and then a year later it was 10,000 a day. In 1991, the first web server outside of Europe was up at Slack, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California. Many would follow. In 1993, CERN management decided that the web should act as an open standard for all to use. That was an essential decision. Today, with nearly two billion websites, we do not remember and cannot even imagine a world without the World Wide Web. So he said this, initially it was very difficult to explain to people what his concept was, but today it's hard to imagine why it was difficult to explain in the first place. And it's 30 years old, nobody even remembers because it's open source and everybody has access to HTTP, HTML, the hypertext protocols. It is not something that he has created to hold the world at ransom, but it changed the world. And this is what he hopes. So I think we must start with our motivation. What is our motivation? And perhaps someday then, we will create instead of just a mesh into a World Wide Web, but a logistics with a net that we in PSA are starting to call it the Internet of Logistics. Thank you very much. <laughs>